And we are recording. All right, Mr. Boobles, kick us off, man. All right, so this week on the podcast, we got Henrik Nieberg. Uh, Henrik's famous for uh, his work at Spotify, but he's also kind of uh, like an artist that has many different albums out there. And uh, we've got Old School, where it's more like in the trenches. Uh, he's got a couple different books, Scrum and XP in the uh, trenches, Scrum and Kanban in the trenches, Lean in the trenches. Um and, and then a lot of software development experience. And then he gets kind of into his pop days where uh, maybe it's uh, popular stuff that's on YouTube, like the Spotify model, activation uh, versus utilization. He's got the PO in a nutshell video that's got millions of views. And, um, you know, a lot of stuff about his time at uh, Lego and at Spotify. And then his new age stuff is uh, he has an organization that he works with, uh, CRISP, and he also has has done a lot of work during in the climate control space. And now, even getting back into full circle, he was just telling us before we started recording, getting back into the development space with uh, some different organizations. So welcome, Hedrick. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, um, I don't know. I, I There's so many things we could talk about with that vast history. But, I mean, let's start with one question that you probably get often, and maybe it's a softball question, but um, how do you feel about, like, the Spotify model and what it's kind of turned into, like, in the Agile community? Like, you put out this video, and it's kind of got grown legs and gone in a lot of different directions, but, like, how, how, how do you feel about what, what's happened with it? Uh, I'm fascinated, uh, sit, sit, sitting on the bleachers watching and kind of scratching my head. Um, <laughs> But mainly, I've learned a lot about how, how models and frameworks get created um, entirely by accident in some cases like this. Uh, and I'm also learning a lot. It's really fun to see what people do. Um, it seems that there's just a huge like thirst for change. And companies are grabbing at whatever they can. And the Spotify model came quite handy. And then people grab it and they um, try similar approaches and they adapt it to their context. And then Sometimes I've visited some of those companies, and it's just yeah, I I I learn a lot just by watching to see what people do with it. Do with it. <laughs> so one great. of the one of the things that have to do with that that I really like um, to get your perspective on was like what what were the technical things that had to happen in order for that model to make sense at Spotify? Oh, uh, you mean technical as in engineering practices yeah. and things like that? Exactly. I would say it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, it's hard to get an agile culture if you don't have some technical practices in place. But it's also chicken and a chicken and egg because sometimes you need to have the agile culture to be willing to make the investments in the technical infrastructure. So, but but in some sense, I would say, like most startups these days, I mean, there's some things people just take for granted. Like you have to have, like uh, you know, a, a, an automated build pipeline to some extent. Otherwise, you're just wasting all your time building stuff and making mistakes. Um, you need some element of test automation. Otherwise, you ch just can't ship often. So some things just kind of are considered rather obvious in, in order to be agile in any way at all. Yeah. So one one of the things that I run into uh, a lot of times is things can look really elegant and very simple and straightforward on a piece of paper. But then yeah. when it gets to the actual implementation side, and this is what I think I'm hearing from what you're saying is, give, give that to a, a, a team, an agile team, and they'll they'll give you all the reasons why that can't work here, right? And yes. then you say, great, those are the things that we need to change. Those like help me understand what what is the first barrier for us to be able to move in this type of direction, and I think. Th that's probably a heavy lift, but I think that's kind of maybe what I'm taking away from what you're saying is chicken and egg. Well, first we have to start with what the North Star is. What do we want to go after? And then that'll just naturally elevate all the impediments and the blockers that are going to get in our way. Yeah. And those are the, the things that we got to start chiseling away at. Yeah, when, when you said uh, uh, we can't because, that pretty much summarizes the story of my coaching life. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, trying to change that conversation from we can't because, changing it to... If we could, would we want to? Hmm. And if so, then let's talk about how to do it. Uh, it's just keeps coming down to that mindset change. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach that when you, because you you do consulting, right? So you come in and, and people say, well, we can't do that like Lego or Spotify. Like we're just not that type of company. Like what do you, what's your, what's your approach? Um, well, First of all, the companies that really, really don't want to change anything, they wouldn't call me or any other coach in the first place because, you know, they're obviously doing everything right already and they don't want to change anything. 
Um, so typically when a company calls a consultant, I don't actually do that kind of consulting now okay. anymore. I, I'm a full-time member of a team essentially doing development, but, mm. but uh, f- in those days, typically when I come in, um, there already was an interest to change something. It's because someone called me in and was willing to put money on the table. <laughs> right? uh, but then once you get in, it often turns out that that person doesn't have super strong support internally because otherwise he or she wouldn't need help maybe. So then it becomes about overcoming internal resistance. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a challenge. But I, I, I normally resort to visualization as a first step, just creating awareness about how things work right now. Um, and when everybody sees the picture of how stuff works right now, then they can reflect upon if they're happy with that or not. And usually once they see it clearly, they normally aren't happy with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so then it's easier to say, okay, well, we could keep things the way they are and get the same results we've always gotten or, or we could change something. When you're doing that visualization, are there um, common patterns that you identify like, oh, this is, this is a common, let, let's say a whip problem, right? Uh, once we start to actually visualize all the lists of stuff that you've got going on, I see that there's a whip problem or yeah. you know, look at all the queue time uh, that, that you're paying for as things are just sitting around waiting to be worked on, which might be the same thing. But are, are there common patterns that you identify when you're, when you're visualizing that type of stuff? Yeah, and definitely nothing surprising. It is the stuff that the agile folks are used to seeing, or the stuff that the lean folks are used to seeing. Uh, the, the the basic yeah to do doing done. Uh, what are all the projects in progress? Maybe some data on cycle times, lead times. Um, Valley stream maps are sometimes useful. Mm-hmm. But I, I normally start with their description of their problem. I ask like kind of do. I start every engagement like that with interviews, one on one interviews, to find out kind of like a mini retro, like what's working right now, what's not, mm-hmm. and then I, I grab onto the what's not working stuff. Um, and then try to put data to that. So people are saying, we're always late. Okay, let's look at the last 10 projects. Which, how many were late? Why were they late? Uh, what does late mean? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so just, yeah, because it's really important to address the things that people care about. Otherwise it becomes this theoretical picture on the wall that nobody cares about. Mm-hmm. So you said that you are now part of a development team. And so what, what made you make that decision to go back to doing development? Because it's been a while, right? Since you've, you've done that? Yeah, I've always kept it going because uh, I just think development is fun. <laughs> Plus, I've always worked with IT companies, or mostly, and uh, by having well, at least one finger left in the jar, um, the coding jar, then it's easier for me to communicate and build trust with people who do development because I can speak their language and understand what, what, what's going on. But mainly, that's just, that's just the excuse. I, I just think it's fun. That's my real reason. <laughs> okay. But, but then uh, recently, I uh, started working with, with Mojang and the, and the Minecraft teams, and then... Uh, um, so one thing led to another, and I just realized this is what I want to do. This is fun. Plus, I, I like combining development with coaching, and that's exactly what I'm doing now. I have a kind of mixed role of doing design development and and coaching within those teams. Okay. So, if you don't mind me asking, what are you? So, what are you doing? Like with the team, what's the, what's the product that you're building? Or um, can you it's, give it's us really, a little? It's really it's it's a really fun game called Minecraft. Yeah, um, I've heard of it. My kids <laughs> play it like nonstop. <laughs> and and uh, we have themed updates. Right now we're working on something called the the Caves and Cliffs update. Okay. So I've spent a lot of time lately uh, um, changing the way we make caves in Minecraft, um, changing the whole world generation algorithm for how we make caves to be able to make them much more exciting and dramatic and interesting. So, But in the past I've worked a lot on quite mixed bag, uh, adding some, added a new mob called Piglin, a new creature. Um, or added some new blocks or mechanics. It's we're we're quite a small team, so we get to touch a lot of different okay. systems inside the game. But I've also worked kind of again. It's a mixed role. So I, so some of my time I spent on kind of coaching the team and helping to figure out things like how do we collaborate across teams? How do we stay aligned? How do we make sure we're building the right features that people care about? Um, awesome. Uh, do you or have you seen of the stuff on Code.org? Um, for kids that use they use a lot of different Minecraft examples. Yeah, they're actually building and they're coding out different things. It's perfect uh, for it. <laughs> it's it's amazing, and I don't know if, if you um, have ever thought about it, but like you'd be a great person to have on. They usually do like a YouTube video of like um, here's why here's how we do events and here's why we do them. Here's how they work in Minecraft, and then like oh. and then you actually build like a Minecraft game out. And oh. I, I found it to be really fun to do with my eight and ten year old, and it's amazing what they can pick up and how fast they can pick that stuff up as you teach them the code. So I don't know, and especially when you link Minecraft to something that they love, you know, like playing, and then you yeah. with with a learning aspect of it of learning coding, it's a pretty cool thing. So. Well, I, I find with, with all learning, it's like a, just a big aha I've been getting the last few years because I have four kids and helping them through school. It, it just becomes so clear to me that kids learn really fast 
when you put them in a context where it's interesting. So for example, you can sit in a math class and learn weird formulas, but if you're sitting at your computer trying to figure out how to make a GPS in a game to auto control this vehicle, or how to get this item to fly in the right trajectory in Minecraft, now you're gonna learn math. You're gonna learn it this fast because you wanna figure out this problem and you're gonna see the results in the game. Mm-hmm. So I realized, yeah, teaching is just a lot about creating a context where the kid needs to solve a problem in order to do what they wanna do. And then they'll just learn it in no time. <laughs> I, I yep. find it interesting. You use that 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 math story there. Um, I I have a, a degree in game design and development. So what, when I was going through school, you know, we, we took the the normal like Six Flags Great America or something like that. You go to the theme park and you're supposed to be studying physics there and whatnot. What what a load of <laughs> bullshit that is. But, um, I, I do distinctly remember when we were first talking about collision in games. And you're like, okay, well, wouldn't it be helpful to know when one object intersects with another object? And then you start talking about collision. Okay, so you've got your very basic collision where you're just taking the two uh, sphere collision, which is the most basic yeah. type of collision there is. You're just taking X minus Y plus the, the radius of each sphere, and that's your most basic collision structure inside of a game. Um, and then you go on to a uh, more rigid body type of uh, collision. Then you could go on to um, a vertice collision, et cetera. And you're just kind of like taking baby steps out further and further to get more specific collision points in a, in a game. But to, to what you were just saying, like when you're able to, to learn that and see the effects in real time, and especially like being a person who loves video games, you're just like, wow, I can, it, there's a purpose to me learning this and I can see the effects of it. And now I'm really interested in it. Like, I, I can tell that story because I, I learned it and understood it so well because it was so directly applicable to the thing that I was trying to do, not yeah. because it was the Pythagorean theorem or whatever the hell that thing was, <laughs> um, and it was just another thing that I needed to, to memorize. So I, I, I really enjoy that point, and I can't empathize with it more, um, that you know when you're set up in the right environment to learn, it just makes it really easy, and you retain it, and you can see directly that how, how it, it is applicable and what you're, the goals that you're trying to achieve. And I think, it, you, you know, you, you said for kids, it's easier when they can actually see like, oh, instead of just learning this concept, I'm, I'm applying it to a problem and I'm solving a problem. I think for any team or anybody yeah. that's trying to learn something, right? Like, that's why the quickest way to demotivate a team is separate them from their customers and the actual problem they're solving and just tell yeah. them to do tasks, right? Like, if you keep them aligned to like outcomes instead of outputs, like, like which is something yeah. we talk about in the Agile community a lot, uh, it, it aligns people to solving problems and, and keeps them motivated and hungry to learn new things and you know motivated to do that so i think that's that's, that's actually one of one of the i know there's no such thing as a silver bullet but some things come pretty close and one of those is having a team just be in touch with their actual users and then just good stuff happens (laughs) that's interesting yep exactly well that's awesome um so I, switching gears here a little bit, um, are you still doing stuff with climate control? I know that was a big thing for you a couple of years ago that you were working and trying to like have a zero footprint. Uh, you were doing that within CRISP. Uh, yeah. Are you still working with organizations to do that? Are you still? Uh, yes, not full time as I was then, um, but mainly I, I co-founded a company called GoClimate.com, um, which is now a real company with full-time people working with this. And uh, my role is not as operational anymore. Um, so I'm mostly supporting them. Uh, but it's a lot of good stuff is happening in that space. Uh, we also have some things going on. Like yeah, I, I'm helping a lot of different organizations in various ways to f- both to reduce their footprint, but also to figure out how to use their own products to, to kind of do the right thing. Cool. How do how does that conversation start though? Like you're working with these clients, uh, like how do they contact you to like say we want to do climate control or we want to help you with the zero footprint? Like how, how, and how do we get started? Like how, well, how does that? T- t- that's typically exactly it. That a company realizes that well, it could be for different reasons. Sometimes it's more cynical that oh we want to look good, <laughs> we should look like we're doing something for climate change, but heck, why not? Then we help them do that, right? Because uh, for whatever reason, if they're doing the right thing because they want to look good while well, it's still doing the right thing as long as they're not just cheating <laughs> but equally often we get companies that are just, you know the people in the company realize that you know this is really bad uh we have to live on this damn planet <laughs> so and then it's, and it's going to hell so we have to do something um and then they look at their own situation realizing well we have a lot of money in this company we have a lot of clout what can we do so then they reach out to get help um, and that's really good that to do because sometimes it's not really obvious what the right thing is 
Uh, there's like a big fat 80-20 rule for like, we can make this change that's going to cost a lot of money and make a very small impact. Or we can make this change which costs quite little money and makes a huge impact. So, And it's quite case by case. Mm-hmm. And how do you um, handle that? Because I can imagine certain cl- companies being like, so you know, we do a lot of sales. We have to travel to different organizations. Giving up, you know, airplane flights across yeah. the world is just not possible for us. Like in our business model, how could we? Even, how can we do this? Like, this isn't going to work for us because, kind of like Jeff was saying, like it doesn't exactly. work here because of this. So what do you? What do you do in those type of situations? Uh, I guess I just wait for things like COVID to come around and prove it wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of things we think aren't possible until we're forced to do it. <laughs> so, so, speaking of which, um, what, what what is I, I'm curious for for you personally. What if anything has the the current COVID environment changed with how you do your work, with how you approach working with teams? Um, r- really, anything in your environment locally? Everything, everything has changed. It's really interesting. Um, first of all, from one day to the next, my team, which was fully co-located, was suddenly fully distributed, just like many other companies. We, but we were very physical. We used the walls and we talked face to face. And you know, we were very much a co-located kind of textbook agile team in that sense. And suddenly we're all home. Where's the wall? Where do we do the stand-ups? Like, uh, but I was really surprised at how fast we adapted. I would say it took about one day and then we were adapted because we just took all the wall stuff and digitized them immediately mm-hmm. in a tool called Miro. So we just, and it, the, the, the boards in Miro look the same as they look on the wall. So we just, instead of standing by it physically, we're in a video conference and standing around this, inside this digital document. Mm-hmm. So that worked surprisingly well. And it kind of confirmed a, a, a theory I've had for a long time. And because I've worked a lot with distributed teams and half distributed teams and kind of that question keeps coming up, like how do we do agile distributed? And my theory has been that, well, you need to get everybody into the same room. That's kind of the key. But that room doesn't have to be physical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so the problem happens when you're in different rooms. Um, in other words, if you have a team where four people are in the same room and one person is in some other city somewhere, then then that person calls in and it's, it's on a screen on the wall. And that person's always going to be kind of outside, not hearing the side conversations, missing out on stuff. And people are having a conversation and they forget to ask that guy, well, how, how do you feel about this? So it's always being left out. And that's a problem. But when everybody's distributed, then we're all in the same digital space like we are right now. Mm-hmm. And then it works a lot better. So I've been kind of surprised. It worked, it worked. I, w- I, can't, I still think it's better to be in the room physical because you get all the informal kind of chit-chat and go to lunch together and all the kind of just being close. But, but uh, yeah, I've been surprised. It worked a lot better than I thought to, to be fully distributed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd agree. I think that um, uniform platform or whatever you're doing, or like whatever the highest level of communication is, everybody being on that same baseline makes a huge yeah. difference, you know. And the video on makes you know all the difference. Cause, you know, yeah. when you when you get into a room where maybe somebody doesn't have great internet connection, and then you have two or three people that don't have the video on, and you have and the rest of the team that yeah. does, it, and they end up, it's kind of like they're on the phone call, and yeah. everybody else is in person. Like it's the same kind of. Um, dispersion that you were talking about before where like maybe they don't get involved maybe they they don't get they don't get pulled into the conversations as much as they should um when, when that video is not on so i think that's crucial too i think it's although, although I've, I've noticed something related to that that there's some things that change like in the past with when teams let's say are used to being co-located and then there's sometimes not a video call then mentally video call means meeting right so i'm now in a meeting therefore we need an agenda and a goal and a time box etc and now that changes because now all we have is this so we can't just be in a meeting all day. So therefore, we have the concept of rooms, the di- digital rooms in my team. And I could go to that room and I'm working on, on one type of project or one type of feature in the game. And other people also working on that area would be in the same room when they want to. They come in and out. Mm-hmm. So the room is no longer a meeting. There's no agenda or anything. It's just a place to go to hang out with people and work together. And that kind of changes everything because it's just a different way of using video. And I've also noticed another thing about the camera thing. We, have now, we now have meetings where... It's almost become like a convention that if you are active in the meeting, then you are visible. And if you are more just observing or kind of passively there, then you are sometimes not visible. And that becomes a nice cue because we can have 10 people in the room and only three are visible. They're having an active conversation. The other seven might be doing email or something in the background, but they're still interested enough to want to be there. So it becomes this interesting thing where traditionally it's considered a bit impolite to be sitting in a meeting room doing other stuff and not participating in the meeting. 
But actually, I find this format opens up for that possibility that, yeah, you, you can be in this room and you don't have to be fully present. You can be partially present and then you can step in and turn on your camera when you want to, you know, be more active. And I think it, that works as long as you're very clear of, like, that's the intent behind this and you have that working agreement. Like, when you go into this yeah. room and you have your video on, you're actively participating. If you shut your video off, it's okay. You can be in the background, but, like, we're not going to feel like we have to pull you in and get your consensus yeah. on something before deciding something because you're not actively participating. Yeah. I like that. Um, I have another um, colleague that I work really closely with, and we have this thing called the coffee shop. So it's just a quick URL to coffee shop, go, opens a Zoom vid- video, and, like, we have to, oh, let's jump on a quick five-minute you know, conversation and to talk about this client or this thing that we needed to align on real quick. And just because it's easy and fast and you have that room like available, I think that's what makes it so much better than what it used to be when we would have yeah. to get on a phone call or we'd have to actually find schedule time to call, something, schedule yeah, something. Calendar. <laughs> exactly. So I think anytime you can use something like that, like you're talking about, just a space that we can quick get to, have the conversation and maybe bounce back to work or maybe just stay in there and keep working. Yeah. I think that's that's a great technique. And of course, you need the tools for it. So I'd say, yeah, don't skimp on tools. Make sure you have what you need. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask real quick, uh, just because you mentioned, you know, hey, we're we're working on a feature together. We jump into this room. Do you still tactically do things like pair program, or are you doing something more like group, or maybe even mob programming, or is it just when you want to spitball ideas off each other, or talk through problems, or implementation of how you're going to go about doing something? Um, can can you share a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, it's it's very in our case with the Minecraft development, it's very contextual. So we don't try to enforce any one pattern there. Um, what happens in practice is that some work is done individually because it's not super complicated and there's not a lot of dependencies. So just sit down and get it done. Um, and then once they have something to show, then there would be of course discussions and feedback and demos and stuff. So that's one pattern. But on the opposite end, we have some features that are super complex and have a lot of dependencies. Um, and then we typically mob program. So it, it varies quite, quite quite a lot, pairing or mobbing or, or a single development. In some cases we develop individually, but then we do mob code reviews hmm. um, or mob testing. Um, so yeah, the full scale of different styles. But, but mainly we try to create an environment where all those different styles are easily accessible. So if I want to do mob, mob programming, I shouldn't have to jump through hoops to do it. It's just that there's a room right here, just click on it. We can share screens, we can code together using plugins and just go. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. It, it, it sounds a lot like um, the, the environment that I'm working in right now. They're, like, they just do what they need to do. And, and they're, they're closest to the problem. They, they figure out the right way to solve it. And so there's a lot of individual activities that you do, but then they, they'll get together and very common to, to what you were just saying was, great, we, we just wrote this kind of gnarly piece of code. It's got a lot of connections over here. Let's all step through it. Let's make sure that it, I didn't yeah. miss anything. Let's kick the tires a little bit. And uh, if they need to make updates, they just go ahead and make those updates. But I, I like that key takeaway that, or at least for me, in, in what you had said, was just create the right environment where people can do what they think is the right thing to do. And I think implicit in that is, and then trust them to do the right thing at the yeah. right time, right? But, but also realize that not everybody, I mean, there's a lot of techniques people don't know about. They're used to working in a certain way and they don't realize there are other ways. So for example, if you've never tried mob programming, that's probably not something you'd want to try unless someone tried to convince you because it sounds kind of bonkers. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, so you kind of need to experience it first. Um, so we try to create an environment where it's easy to to see these kind of things. So let's say there's a, a room where we're mob programming this new feature. We try to make that very visible that this room is there and anybody can step in. There's no commitment. You can come in and just watch if you want. So sometimes people do that. They jump in, they're lurking in the background, video off, coding their own thing. But then once in a while they're like, oh, wait a sec, that's really interesting. What, what did you just do? And they jump in and start asking questions. Mm-hmm. And then we have knowledge sharing. But more importantly, people see that, oh yeah, this is a thing. This is a way to work. Um, and, and then it adds to their kind of toolkit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like another thing that you just kind of pointed out there, but it, it's self-selection, right? It's I'm yeah. choosing to be part of this and not I'm being told to be part of this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although it is funny because when I came into the team in the beginning, I still had my old kind of some some coaching habits, um, some good habits, but also some bad habits. And and one habit, one thing I brought up was because I, 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 mob programming is something that I like. I've seen it do a lot of good. So I asked people like if they'd be willing to try mob programming, just g- give it a chance, give it a day. And I only got like 10% of people saying, yeah. The rest were like, eh, nah. <laughs> so I didn't do it. I didn't push it. Um, but then later on, it started happening anyway because of people tried it on their own without being asked to try it. it. Just they stumbled into it. So again, I often find it more useful just to have, you place these things out so that people can discover them instead of trying to 
push them in that direction. <laughs> I have a similar experience with a client. You know, we're remote, obviously, and and I just felt like they had hired a lot of new people. You know, a year or two out of college, and it's like oh, you can just learn so much from each other if they would just do some app programming and like share their knowledge back and forth. And I kept suggesting it as we were kind of talking through like how do we you know learn faster. And they just weren't trying it. So I was like, okay, we have this meeting that's already standing and it's for knowledge sharing. And we always just talk like about like yeah. things. I'm like, what if we just pull up a code editor and we just start and we just start coding? Like, well, here's a problem and let's just start coding and f- try to figure out how we'd fix it together. Yeah. And they just start doing it. And it's like, oh, this is a beautiful thing. Now I just step back and let them just do it. Yeah. And, and, and now they tend to really like <laughs> that and they get a lot of value out of that. So uh, I don't know. Sometimes there's just different ways to get started, right? Because people yeah, are like nudging, oh. right? Nudging. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it started, the, the mob programming thing started actually with mob reviews. Because it'd be like, we realized organically people realize that it's better to be more eyes when doing a code review both to catch problems but also to learn because while while doing code reviews we're also talking about the code and then you get this kind of informal standards popping up so it became a, a common pattern to review stuff in a group and that gradually led to hey it's also useful to debug things in a group and then one thing led to the other and suddenly some groups are sitting and coding together in a group so just yeah i had to i had to debuzzwordify it i didn't talk about mobbing just took that off the table and just yeah. was just working. Later on, I pointed out that this thing is normally called mobbing, by the way. So if you want to learn more about it, you can read about it here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We were we were just talking with uh, uh, an old buddy, uh, Andrew. Jeez, uh, 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 it's familiar to me. Bec- yeah, yeah. I remember the last name, but I, I was going to mention it. Um, but specifically, because I just edited the episode, episode and we just launched it yesterday. Um, who knows when this one will come out? But uh, the 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 thing that I wanted. The thing that was in my head from what you were just saying was he was he works uh, with with Microsoft in particular with large medical organizations and part of what so he brings both the the powers of Microsoft AI the cloud uh, to to these businesses help them understand it um, but then also just agile principles um, and I, I, we were we were talking with him about hey so like how does this how how receptive are these medical organizations to this agile stuff and how do you how do you go about having the conversation. And, and I just recall him saying, well, I don't really talk about Agile. Right? Like, it, it's not, that isn't important to them. Just focus on what they're going to get out of it and just help kind of yeah. shepherd them on the way. And that's, that's really what's more important, whether or not we, we call it the right term or we're doing everything by the book. Like, that's, that's far less important. It's what, what's the benefits of this stuff. And they'll just naturally gravitate towards that because it becomes so intuitive once you start seeing this stuff in motion. And I think kind of yeah. tying this back to what we were talking about at the beginning was, it looks really elegant on a piece of paper, but like, how do we how do we get there, and why would we want to go there? Like, is that a change that we would want to mm-hmm. make? And just kind of helping shepherd them along. And I hear, heard a lot of that same thing when you were talking about introducing mob programming. Uh, we don't need to call it whatever it is, and we can start with just this first increment or this first step yeah. in the right direction. And then, great, when they see the value of it, great. Then to Jeff's point, you just step back and allow it to grow uh, organically. Okay, I can't help myself. I'm going to coin a buzzword. You ready? Yes. Upcoming buzzword. Here it comes. Post buzzword agile. Post buzzword Boom. agile. That's where we are. That's where we're going. That's where that's the, that's what I'm seeing everywhere. It's it's still agile, but it's agile without needing all the buzzwords in the same sense. Mm. I don't know if that's everywhere, but it's uh, around the companies I've been working with the past few years. That's definitely a a, a, key, a strong trend. And so, by that, do you mean? You know, people don't use the words, but they're just doing it um, because that's just a natural way of working now. Yeah, basically combining the different flavors of agile into a soup, <laughs> but but without really talking about or caring about the the words, the buzzwords. They're not needed. You can work in a cross-functional team without calling it a scrum team. You mm-hmm. can deliver on a regular cadence without calling it sprints. Although most companies that do work with do use concepts such as daily stand up and sprints so i guess there are some buzzwords still still around but uh, it's just not so much focused on them anymore it's more like okay what are we going to improve what are we going to improve next and then just taking techniques from various schools of thinking yeah it's funny you mentioned that so I, i'm doing a, a product on a course yesterday and then today is going to be day two of it and I, I actually do an activity that i stole from from jeff and another great uh, PST. His name's Chad, um, and we just talk about agile. And he's like, "All right, so what are all the words that come to mind?" And like, we, we just make a mind map of all these words. And and yesterday, one of them was was buzzword. Literally, like, students said, "Oh, what do you think of when you hear the word agile?" It's buzzword. You know, we just got to do it because it's cool, and everybody else is doing yeah. it, right? Um, but then, 
So day two is uh, teaching the framework, teaching Scrum, you know, the 11 elements, all that jazz. And as we're going through them and as we're introducing them, I, I try and articulate the, the why behind this stuff and w w where I'm getting to with, with your, your, you know, every company kind of does sprints and a, a daily Scrum or a daily standup, whatever they call it internally, doesn't really matter. Um, but I just tell the team like, hey, wouldn't it make sense? Wouldn't it make sense if we're accountable for creating something within this time box, whether it's a week, a, a month, a few days, doesn't really matter. Wouldn't it make sense that at a minimum, once a day we get together and talk about how it's going? Like if we're accountable for creating, wouldn't that just kind of make sense intuitively? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that would make sense. We should probably talk at least once a day. There you yeah. go. That's your daily scrum. It, right. it's, it's a lot easier to sell, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it really is. So don't get wrapped up with these words. Get wrapped up why yeah. they're there. What's the value of this thing in the framework? And so um, th those are always fun light bulb moments when you're having conversations with people. And you can back away from the dogma of thou shalt have a daily scrum in the same The book says this. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but why do you think the book says that? What do you think you're yeah. going to get out of that? Why should it make sense that they would put this in the book? And you just have a fun conversation with them, and then you, they can make those connections. And then plus, anyone can find a book that says the opposite, and then you're yep. then then what? <laughs> yeah, well, then then maybe you know enough to be able to challenge it and understand yeah. why. But um, well, it yeah. reminds me of like a general pattern I noticed after a bunch of years of coaching was when I come to a new client, I quite quickly need to figure out is agile a good word or a bad word here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be either. So if it's a good word, everyone's, and then I can talk about agile. People are like, yes, please help us go agile. This is where we want to go. Great. In other cases, people are cynical, like, oh no, don't give me this agile crap. They just don't talk about it. But but they they do want to do the things. They just don't like all the fancy words. Yep. So I have to quickly find out which which, which is it. It's usually either one or the other. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I, I think most of the time, even when people like say they don't like that agile word, when you start talking values and principles, because that's usually where I go with them, yeah, and you find out you're very aligned. Like, yeah, I want frequent yeah. delivery. Yeah, I want to reduce my risk. Yeah, I, I would love to see stuff and test early and often and like get real feedback from customers. Great, cool. We have yeah. some ways to do that to help you out, you know? And that's something that, that, that keeps surprising me, like how actually uncontroversial agile actually is when you get beyond the buzzwords and get into the what, what are we talking about? It's fairly common sense and a lot of resistance is just because of misunderstandings so I, 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 it's also interesting. not not just misunderstandings but i feel like we we, we kind of created that problem for ourselves and we being the agile community um yeah I use that word specifically, the, the dogma that sometimes the fire and brimstone that we can bring to conversations yeah. and how by the books oh, that reminds me all oh, in the, in the with I think it was Ken Schwaber used to say I attended his course in the early days and Someone asked, like, when should you not use Scrum? And his answer was, only when you want to fail or when you don't need to succeed. It was something like that. I'm just like, this is this is not productive. <laughs> this is religion, please. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's I, a lot of good there's a lot of good ideas here. Let's not not blur them with religion on top, right? <laughs> I would say definitely about a decade ago, there seemed to be definitely wars within the Agile community. But you definitely, I don't know if you think the same thing, Henrik, but I, what I feel like over the last two or three years there seems much more of a let's come together and use scrum and xp together yeah. together let's use oh, yeah. kanban and scrum together let's use different scaling frameworks together like let's combine all the stuff into the soup you were talking about and people seem very open to that like that seems to be the most common pattern that actually out there that i'm seeing yeah i know i i, I totally agree and it's quite refreshing <laughs> although i still find it useful to learn different frameworks and stuff just as long as you don't treat them as dogma right yeah there's always something that you can pull from them um, you know, there's, oh, why are you doing it this way? You know, and oh, you're solving this same problem we would solve over uh, here this way, this way. That might be work better in different contexts, you know? So uh, I love that too. So what, um, or, I'm sorry. okay, I'll jump in here really quick. So what, uh, what are the big, big things that you're trying to work on now? What are the big changes in the world that you're trying to make? Oh, um, I wouldn't say I'm trying to make big changes in the world right now, other than the climate change stuff. Um, but right now I'm just trying to build a fun game. <laughs> but I guess in general, when it comes to like, th there are some things that I've always been trying to spread. Um, mostly because I noticed that it just works and it makes people happy, which makes me feel happy. <laughs> but basic principles like visualize where you are now, where you want to go. 
I find that principle so useful, whether it's in your own personal life or in your company or in your family or whatever, just that visualization exercise. It's just super useful. So that's, I guess, one thing. And the other is an experimental mindset. And again, that's also useful for your team or when raising kids or whatever, or when solving climate change, right? Experimental mindset, in other words, don't assume that you'll figure out the right answer from the beginning because you won't. Mm -hmm. But that shouldn't stop you. Instead, try something and then learn from it and then try again. That whole And that mindset is built into the scientific method. It's also built into Agile. But I find it useful to make it part of your life, essentially. Um, so yeah, I just, I'm always trying to, trying to spread that. Mostly, not so much convincing people, but more by spreading stories that I find inspiring. So, I don't know. This isn't a podcast about Agile topics. Where, where do you see Agile in, in the future? Because we've kind of talked about where it used to be the dogmatic, to the soup, to where do you think it's going to be five, ten years from now? Um, I think the word is going to go away and be forgotten. Um, mm. And that's fine, I think. Um, there are going to be new buzzwords that come to take its place, probably. Um, and those buzzwords will probably mean something fairly similar to Agile, what we've talked about, but with some some um, new aspect to it. For example, like I more often nowadays hear the concept of remote first. Companies or teams are saying, we are remote first as a principle, which means that instead of saying that we work physically when we can and remotely when we can't, we do the opposite. We work distributed and not in real time whenever we can, and then we meet physically or, or in real time when, when we need to. That, that doesn't conflict with Agile, but it puts another spin on it because Agile by default is is face-to-face first. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's going to be some things like that, uh, movements that come. Some will come and go. For example, the no estimates movement, I think if, if it's still even a thing, I think it's going to go away because in my mind, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but there are some, but while, for example, the remote first movement, if we call it that, I think, I think does make sense. So uh, yeah, buzzwords will, will come and go and each buzzword will push us in some direction, hopefully a good direction, until we're all moving in that direction. Then the buzzword doesn't goes to die where buzzwords go to die. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah. I got to nudge you a little bit on this one because I'm super interested yeah. in, in there's, there's no right or wrong to this. I want to be clear with it. I have yeah. no skin in the game. How, what what are your thoughts on the no estimates? What what was the behind the comment of it doesn't make sense? Like what 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 about that for you? Um, in my mind, I find that when I when I talk to people that are driving that movement, because uh, I often get questions about it during courses and stuff. So I was kind of curious. So I was trying to get behind, you know, to find out what's going on. I realized, okay, this is a reaction against against uh, trying to estimate upfront in detail, and then sticking to those estimates. Um, and, and I think and that I totally agree with but taking that you take any good idea and take it too far it tends to become a bad idea so, so taking that and saying therefore we should not at all try to evaluate whether this thing is, is a lot more effort than that thing makes no sense at all in my mind because if I'm a product owner or something and I got these five features to prioritize between it's very useful for me to know that this one is going to take more time than all those together that'll make for better prioritization Mm-hmm. So to say that we're not allowed to do that because of reasons doesn't make sense in my book. Yeah, I think the intent behind the no estimates is to move from an analysis mindset where we try to figure out everything right away to a feedback mindset of let's try to learn as we start doing stuff. Yeah, That's the intent, right? Like, let's just count the number of things we had done and then yeah. like figure out like what we should kind of do next. But I, I agree, like you can take it way too far. Anything you can take too far. Yeah, and it becomes the opposite of what you want it to be, right? It's like saying a house burnt down yesterday, therefore we should never use fire. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, well, y- your intent was right. <laughs> <laughs> but, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I, at this time, Henrik, I, I just want to thank you for coming on the podcast and um, see if there's anything you want to plug to our audience, anything you want to promote um, going forward. Um, well, I guess if I get to plug things, I'm going to plug one thing since there's a lot of, since you talked about the climate change thing, uh, there's often a lot of confusion and misunderstandings about what that's all about. So there was a period when I worked basically full time trying to decode this kind of climate change for dummies thing. And I learned a lot. And it was fascinating, but also I felt really important to understand what's causing it, um, what are the consequences of it, and what can you do as, a, as an individual or as a company or as whatever, to, to, to what, what, what can you do about the problem? Um, and my experience from, from helping companies is that once you understand the root cause of a problem, you're, you know, you're halfway done, right? It's a lot easier to solve if you understand the problem itself. 
So uh, I, I made a video that summarizes the whole thing. What is it? What causes it? What, 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 what's going to happen if we don't solve it? And what can we do to mitigate it? So that video is, is called Friendly Guide to Climate Change. And okay. there's no commercial interest behind it. It's just a, it's a YouTube video. We'll so link that. Look we'll, it up. Yeah. yeah, we'll put it in the show notes so people can get to it right from yeah. there. Cool. And for those who like my Agile product ownership in a nutshell video, uh, this is the same style. Frantic drawing and talking very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds awesome. awesome. <laughs>